Good evening. My name is Diana Tweet, and I'm the CATS Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Colby College Museum of Art. On behalf of the museum staff and our main based presenters, I acknowledge our presence on unceded Wabanaki land. We express our respect to the indigenous communities who have lived on these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and to the future generations. We recognize the legacies of settler colonialism and make an ongoing commitment to building relationships with the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, and Abenaki peoples. Our program tonight is part of the Art and series for the 2021 to 22 academic year. These programs bring together visiting artists, scholars, museum staff, and community experts for conversations about exhibitions, collections, and projects at the Colby College Museum of Art and its Lunder Institute for American Art. These programs will be a mix of in-person, hybrid, or virtual events designed for anyone who is interested in learning more about art and the key issues of our time. Like many American painters of his generation, Bob Thompson sought inspiration in mythological subjects. In Thompson's case, this meant reinterpreting compositions such as Titian's Perseus and Andromeda, which is currently on view in the United States for the first time as part of the exhibition Titian, Women, Myth, and Power at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Tonight's conversation features Carol O'Neill, Julian D. Taylor, Professor and Chair of Classics at Colby College, and Nathaniel Silver, William and Leo Porvu, Curator of the Collection and Division Head at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I'm thrilled that they're able to join us as we consider these two artists, and it's safe to say they've never been brought together in such an event alongside one another. So make yourself comfortable as questions come to you. Please submit them using the Q&A tab, which is located in the bottom of your screen. My curatorial colleague, Sierra Height, will help us to field questions at the end of the program. And if you need closed captioning, you can find that at the bottom right of your screen. To start, each of us will offer a brief introduction before launching into more of a discussion. Next slide, please. We have the title wall for the exhibition here at the Colby College Museum of Art, Bob Thompson, This House is Mine. Thompson's work confronts history, roots itself in the present, and anticipates futurity. A close friend of his, Hetty Jones, once noted, I always think about Bob Thompson's work in terms of how new it was, although in many ways it was of course old. Next slide, please. This exhibition surveys the brief career of this American painter who earned critical acclaim in the late 1950s for canvases of formal complexity and chromatic exuberance. He turned to figuration at a moment when the dominant strains of gestural and coloristic abstraction seemed to have run their course. And he synthesized a new visual language from artistic traditions central to European cultural formation. Thompson, who you see here, was born into a middle-class black family in Louisville, Kentucky, his father was killed in a tragic automobile accident in 1950 when he was 13. He briefly studied medicine at Boston University before enrolling at the University of Louisville. Through the university, he was given the opportunity to spend the summer of 1958 in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he continued his artistic training before settling in New York City. A devotee of jazz, Thompson frequented downtown clubs such as Slug Saloon and the Five Spot Cafe. In the spring of 1961, he and his wife Carol made their first trip to Europe, spending time in London and Paris 
and settling in Spain. Overseas, Thompson was able to fully immerse himself in the traditions that form the core of his practice. Next slide, please. Just showing you a few installation shots. When he returned to New York in 1963, Thompson began to exhibit at major galleries. And then on their second trip overseas in 1965, the couple settled in Rome. Next slide, please. There, Thompson died of a pulmonary edema in his sleep on May 30th, 1966, after a series of complications following surgery. Next slide, please. Thompson was engaged in a heady dialogue with the painters of his day. Like those individuals working in pure abstraction, he resisted description. As he said, my whole problem is trying to convey without the detail. He exploited the immediacy of color and gesture and pushed back against expectations of resolve and legibility as he generated friction between the operations of representation and abstraction. Here's an example of a work from 1958 that points to some of his emerging compositional preoccupations. It also establishes the ways he will take liberties with narrative. So here he paints the funeral of another painter, the German artist Jan Müller, a figurative expressionist who imbued his representations of literary and mythological subjects with energy borrowed from modes of abstraction. Thompson never met Müller and wasn't present for his funeral, but he renders the event in a kind of poetic monochrome that can be doubly suggestive of a fantasy or a memory. Next slide, please. Thompson's painterly citations can be very explicit and also very layered. There's really no end of references and influences to be found in his work. Some that come to mind, Degas' Riders, Manet's Olympia and Her Maid, Edvard Munch's Absinthian Greens, the German Expressionists' Intensity. Thompson looks through these 19th and early 20th century artists to the Renaissance artists they were gazing back to. And here you have a great example of that. Uh, a painting that draws on Olympia, but Olympia in turn uh, drawing, of course, upon Titian's Venus of Urbino. Next slide, please. We'll return to this later, to, um, but just to put a, um, a flag in this, mythological themes were of course um, popular among other artists of the early and mid 20th century, particularly for the ways they enabled them to assert connections to pre-modern cultures and to make claims of authenticity. So this is the milieu into which Thompson emerges. In the 1940s, New York school painters claimed to be interested in the ways that cultural values survived within these myths. And I, I find a, one quotation from Mark Rothko useful. The myth holds us, therefore, not through its romantic flavor, not the remembrance of beauty of some bygone age, not through the possibilities of fantasy, but because it expresses to us something real and existing in ourselves, as it was to those who first stumbled upon the symbols to give them life. For Thompson, the interest seems to be honing in on the indivisible features of these narratives, generalizing or universalizing them, expanding their allegorical breadth, drawing forward subtexts, exposing or exaggerating conventions. He seems to appreciate coarsening these subjects, making them more crude materially and pictorially he creates images that are highly personal, but not explicitly self-referential. And one reviewer in 1969 referred to them as his 
quote, private mythological subjects, which I think is a great way to describe their simultaneous familiarity and unavailability. Next slide, please. Just wrapping up. So very briefly, um, to sort of set the scene, uh, before we look more closely at Thompson's take on Titian, just a few other instances where he has found inspiration in the work of other artists. So you can see here uh, him adapting the moralizing lang pictorial language of Goya's satire in Los Caprichos. And next slide, please. He here recasts one of Baroque painter Nicolas Poussin's Bacchanals with singer and songwriter Nina Simone at left, standing astride the scene in purple. And so I'm now gonna turn things over to Nat, who can tell us a little bit about the Titian exhibition. Um, he'll be followed by Carol, and then we'll launch into our discussion. Thank you so much, Diana, for that warm welcome. Um, so excited about this exhibition that you've put together. This house is mine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Titian and specifically a group of mythological paintings that he made for King Philip II of Spain. And the reason why they're relevant tonight is because several of them were points of reference and inspirations for Bob Thompson's own works. Now, when we talk about um, the canon of Western European painting, this group of six mythological paintings by Titian is right at the center of it. And so they, they provide a, a very useful point of reference, um, not just uh, in Titian's own time, they were famous already when he made them in the 16th century, but for artists in his wake across the spectrum from painters like um, Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, uh, Velazquez, all the way up through Manet, and of course Bob Thompson, who we're talking about tonight. So it's really not an exaggeration to say that this group of six mythological paintings by Titian were transformative to the history of Western European painting um, and American painting as well. Now, the, this group of paintings comes together really as, as a plan hatched between two men in the early part of the 16th century. And I wanna move on to the next slide just to show you portraits of them here. Um, we've got on the left here, a self portrait of the Venetian painter Titian. And we've got on the right, a portrait of uh, King Philip II of Spain. Well, when he's painted, he's, he's prince. Um, and these are, two, these are the two men um, who were responsible for this cycle, this group of six mythological paintings that are right now reunited at the Gardner Museum for the first time. Now, when Philip engaged Titian, he was a very young man. He was about 21 or so years old. He was in his early 20s. He had just inherited a global empire. So that included parts of Europe, Africa, the Americas, and even the Far East. Now, Titian, in his part was at a very different stage in his life. He was in his 60s. He was a veteran painter. He was a painter of international celebrity sought after by sovereigns across Europe. He had painted for two popes, for the Holy Roman Emperor, and he was now engaged by his son, uh, Charles V's son, Philip II, um, to create a group of paintings. Now we know that the two came together in Augsburg, Germany in the fall of 1550 and they hatched a plan. And that plan consisted of a group of religious works. Uh, so altarpieces, for example, because Philip was the great Catholic ruler of Europe, um, as well as this group of six mythological paintings that are the subject of our talk tonight. Now we don't know a huge amount about the details of this interaction. There's not, there's not a lot of evidence that survives of their conversations around it, but it led to a decade long project during which Titian sent from Venice to Spain and elsewhere in Europe, um, six mythological subjects, all on canvas, all very large scale. Now, the subjects of these paintings were taken from the ancient Roman poet Ovid, 
Um, he was Ovid, uh, his Metamorphoses were the most familiar source of classical mythology at that point in Renaissance Europe. Um, Philip owned several editions, Titian owned uh, one as well, at least. And they, of course, Titian looked to other sources as well, but to Ovid was really his touchstone. And he chose, and we think that Titian was really crucial to this choice. Titian seems to have had a lot of latitude in choosing different stories. Um, we don't know exactly what Philip specified, but um, Titian began the group um, with one painting. And so we'll, we'll start with the next slide here and I'll show you an installation view of the Gardner Museum. So, oh, sorry, here's actually the six paintings in total. Um, so you see that there are um, these six mythological subjects. Uh, it started on the left-hand side with the subject of Danai and Venus and Adonis, um, followed by the two subjects of the goddess Diana and then on the right with Perseus and Andromeda on the top that uh, Diana was speaking about earlier. And finally, the painting, The Rape of Europa, which belongs to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and is the reason that this exhibition is currently at the museum. Now, one of the interesting things about the correspondence between Titian and Philip is that Titian has a specific name for these paintings. He calls them poesie, so in Italian, um, literally translating as painted poetries. Titian uses this word very deliberately. It's an unusual word for painting at this time. He seems to be trying to elevate his art, his painting to the level of poetry, classical poetry. Poetry at that time is considered a liberal art. Painting is not yet of that status. And so he's literally um, elevating the work that he's doing by challenging the written word of Ovid with the brush. And, in doing so, he's making a statement. He's laying claim to the artistic ingenuity um, and creativity of the past. Now, one of the interesting things about this cycle of paintings is that Titian seems to have conceived them as he moved along over the decade of, of creation in pairs. And so that's how we've installed them at the Gardner Museum. And if we move on to the next slide, I'll show you an installation view of that, of our galleries there. So here is the first pair of mythological subjects that Titian delivered to Philip. On the left, you see the princess Danai lying in her bedroom. And on the right, you see the goddess Venus and her lover, the hunter Adonis, um, who is uh, going out um, after a night of lovemaking with Venus and he's about to be gored by the wild boar. Many of these stories, um, have very violent consequences. And that was a, a subject which we committed to exploring in this exhibition in some detail. Now, we know that these paintings were considered as pairs because Titian writes in his letter to Philip, one of the first letters that he, when he delivers the Venus and Adonis, he says, I want you um, to compare the way in which I've painted the female nude from the front in Danai and from uh, the back in the Venus and Adonis. And it cues us into the idea that this is a way that Titian has united his compositions formally um, by using a kind of shared language, pictorial language within the pairs. Um, and it, it cues us into a, a particular type of, of series of comparisons that he wants us to make. Now, at the same time, it also reminds us that one of the, the major subjects of these compositions are female nudes, and you'll see that throughout um, the paintings. And that, that's one of the reasons why we took a particular interpretational approach that I'll talk a little bit about at the end of this presentation. The second pair of paintings is in the next slide. And that is the pair of Diana and Acteon on the left. So the hunter Acteon stumbling into the sacred grotto of Diana by accident, um, much to the dismay of Diana herself, who in her wrath transforms him into a stag and he's torn apart by his own hounds. And on the right, the story of Diana again and Callisto uh, the nymph who's raped by Jupiter becomes pregnant and then is cast out of Diana's um, sacred grotto uh, because Diana is the goddess of chastity and um, Callisto has betrayed that vow. In this, in this pair, I think for the first time, 
Titian really brings to fruition the, the kind of formal relationships between the component elements of the pair. So with the single element of the river that continues from the painting of Acteon on the left into the painting of Diana and Callisto on the right. And he does the same thing in the background in the landscape by extending the hillside landscape, um, beginning in the Diana and Acteon painting and ending in the Diana and Callisto painting. So he really uses these different compositional elements to unite these two stories almost as two episodes of the same story, effectively. Now, when he comes to the final pair, which you'll see in our um, final slide here, you see the story of Perseus and uh, saving the princess Andromeda on the left, um, the princess whose mother had boasted um, of her daughter's beauty and had her daughter had been punished. Um, and you see Perseus who had uh, been flying by and decided to rescue her if her parents would give him her hand in marriage. And then on the right, you see the Rape of Europa. That's the final painting in this series delivered by Titian to Philip in 1562. It tells the story of the princess Europa, who is the object again of uh, the god Jupiter's lust, uh, who transformed himself into a bull in order to get close to her and who carried her off to the island of Crete where he raped her um, and her children eventually um, gave birth to the founding civilization of Europe, the Minoans. So this is no less than the, the legendary foundation myth of Europe itself. Now, as you can tell from the description, well, the title alone of that painting, The Rape of Europa, these paintings, uh, many of which have these uh, violent, uh, bloody or uh, quite um, grim um, endings to their stories are, you know, very complicated topics. And we deliberately chose to engage with these questions of gender, of sexuality, and specifically sexual violence in the stories represented in this exhibition, how Titian depicts these stories and their relevance for our own time, what they say to us today. And with that in mind, we commissioned two contemporary artists. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, I can show you their responses. Um, Mary Reed Kelly and Patrick Kelly on the left, who created a short film, a series of um, limericks and Tom Swifties that responds specifically to the Rape of Europa painting uh, in the Gardner Museum. And then the legendary conceptual artist, Barbara Kruger, who created this two-story high installation body language on the front facade of the Gardner Museum, which responds uh, specifically to the Diana and Acteon painting in our series. So this was part of our commitment to exploring the relevance of these stories and their, their complicated consequences in our own time. And it complemented uh, programs, a series of public programs that we did, lectures, uh, talks, and conversations, as well as interpretation in the galleries, all of which is available online. Uh, and in addition to that, resources uh, provided by our partners at the Boston Rape Crisis Center, um, which provide uh, uh, online resources, which can be accessed by anyone in the exhibition at any time or uh, following the exhibition after your visit. Now, I know that we're going to engage further with some of these mythological stories tonight and the way that Bob Thompson was exploring them. And with that in mind, I want to turn the microphone over to my colleague, Carol, who I know is going to talk a little more about the uh, mythological origins of these stories. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and in such uh, August company. Um, I thought I would start off by saying just a little bit about why artists cared about myth and uh, why we do too. And first of all, in order for, you know, myths are created by um, traditional societies, that is non-literate societies. And uh, they, uh, it, so myth had to be worth transmitting to make it worth passing down orally and taking that effort to memorize it and to pass the story on. Um, it is for a couple of reasons this happens. One is just narrative force or charm. The story is just compelling, people want to see it and uh, they, they therefore are, are read it, hear it um, and, and are entertained by it. Uh, but 
there's also a kind of functional relevance, which uh, myth can sometimes explain an important phenomenon or a custom in an etiological uh, sense. It can palliate a recurring social dilemma, help us deal with the traumas of death, rape, uh, loss, and so on. Um, it can also record or establish a useful institution or simply express an emotion necessary to the individual. Now, of course, by the time Abud was uh, with us, writing was around, and this permitted him to do some different things. It allowed him a kind of complexity and time for reflection, but also on occasion, uh, playfulness, which isn't immediately visible in um, the, the paintings that we've just been looking at, or at least as, as, as we speeded by them uh, in this introduction. Um, but this painting here, Diane and Callisto, I thought I'd use it as a way of um, illustrating that to some extent. Um, it tells the story, as Matt said, of uh, Callisto, who has been tragically, is being tragically punished here for being the victim of sexual aggression by Jupiter. And uh, it, it's interesting that the, she has fallen pregnant after Jupiter disguised himself as Diana, um, and uh, use the intimacy between the nymph and uh, her beloved goddess to gain access to her, to uh, trick her and uh, overpower her. Um, it is Ovid stresses in a moment of narrative empathy that no girl, no woman could withstand the power of Jupiter. And if only Juno had seen her fight, maybe she would have been more kind, more gentle to her um, later. Uh, but. Eventually, nine months later, uh, Callisto has been hiding her pregnancy from the virgin goddess. But on a hot day, Diana decides she and all the nymphs should uh, take a bath. And this is when the nine month uh, pregnancy of, of Callisto is exposed. Diana justifies or encourages the, the nymphs to strip off by saying, you know, we can relax, uh, let's have a bath. Um, uh, every judge arbiter is far away. Now, of course, Arbiter can have the sense in Latin of an eyewitness, um, which uh, Callisto sadly lacked at the earlier part of the story. Um, and now uh, it's a different kind of witness is being born. And sadly, no fair judge, Arbiter, uh, I think Ovid is using in a kind of ironic way, um, stressing the unfairness of what happens to Callisto as she is cast out from this company, um, which has been her, her uh, resource and her source of comfort for so long. And you know, we, Nat just mentions that the companion piece for this painting was uh, Diana and Acteon, where, as he said, Acteon is horrifically punished for accidentally witnessing the goddess naked. Um, so Diana, in both cases, is a harsh judge, quick to um, pass judgment, and uh, therefore allowing cruelty and injustice, something that Ovid uh, himself um, was to experience. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it bears, uh, uh, as we, I, I was thinking Nat's words about uh, competing, uh, Titian competing uh, with the brush against Ovid's words, made me think as well of how Ovid plays with the silencing of his uh, characters. Um, Callisto will be silenced as she was turned into a bear by vengeful Juno. Actian is silenced by being turned into a stag. So nobody can understand them. They cannot uh, speak up in their defense. Um, and uh, this is often the fate of the powerless when they're uh, faced with and somebody unjust in power. So maybe we could move to the next slide and say a little bit about uh, a Thompson painting. The Echo and Narcissus story is another uh, fabulously popular story from uh, Ovid's uh, Metamorphoses. And here Thompson is responding to another Nicolas Poussin painting and he repeats the three figures from Poussin's painting. You see the prostrate Narcissus, you see the blue reclining echo, and a little yellow figure of a boy possibly leaning back against a rock, or he seems almost more to be striding in this uh, version. Um, and uh, in, in uh, Poussin's painting, uh, that was a little Cupid or Eros. Uh, Narcissus is the child of a river god and nymph um, whose mother sought uh, prophecy about what would happen to him in his life. Would he live a long time? And the great prophet Tiresias said that he would live a long time if he never knew himself, which is interesting because it directly confronts the famous Apollonian maxim, 
Gnothisa auton, know thyself, which was something so many ancients uh, tried to live by. Um, but anyway, Ovid playfully describes the inter initial interaction of Echo and Narcissus, where the cursed nymph who can only um, repeat parts of what she hears, she's not able to have any original speech due to another interaction with a, a vengeful goddess. And uh, she responds, she's fallen in love with uh, Narcissus. So he one day calls out, is anyone, is anyone here? And she responds here. And they continue this kind of echoing uh, conversation for a while with Ovid um, not uh, passing up an opportunity for a little bit of lascivious wordplay. At one point, Narcissus uh, calls out, let's come together here. And uh, Echo rather nautically replies, just let's, let's just come together. Um, but anyway, uh, the story then rapidly turns uh, a bit more tragic because Narcissus violently rejects her, um, which I suppose um, may be why she has the blues here. Um, we may have an opportunity to talk about the coloring later. Um, and uh, Narcissus goes on to spurn boys and girls. Uh, and eventually one of those rejected male lovers prays to the goddess Nemesis, who makes him fall in love with himself. For the Romans, uh, love was often seen as a, as a wound, a disease, a madness, uh, a magical charm of which you had no power. And in this case, uh, Narcissus uh, suffers from his overwhelming love for himself, which is actually violating that other famous Apollonian maxim, made in again, nothing in excess. Uh, his excessive love for himself dooms him. And so Poussin's painting uh, acknowledged that Narcissus will turn into flowers, uh, which is what so often happens to a preserve a dying lover or to preserve um, the, a threat against virginity. Um, but in Thompson's uh, re a response to uh, Poussin's painting, there is no hopeful sign of the flowers uh, by his head. Um, we can maybe recall though that uh, in Ovid's text, the uh, last words of Narcissus, as he says, alas and farewell as he wastes away, are picked up uh, by Echo. And um, uh, that brings uh, that brings their interaction to a rather tragic close, but has nonetheless been compelling for many others. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Diana, to introduce the conversation. Thank you, uh, both of you. Um, I know the temptation to go down rabbit holes is, is vast. Um, <laughs> So I think from here, we wanna to turn to look at a couple of paired works of art and think about them in tension with one another, considering some of their divergences and also some of the things that they amplify from um, the textual or pictorial sources. And, you know, I just wanna pause and note, even in contrast, I think even to Titian, the challenges of dealing with the traces left by someone like Bob Thompson, who was an itinerant artist of color. He was an expatriate for three of the eight years of his mature production, and he died so young and was understudied for so many intervening decades before the Whitney Museum of American Art Show in 1998. So I think it's sort of a, um, just bears noting um, but I want to start by just flashing a few of these uh, examples of his Perseus and Andromeda images. So next slide, please. And whereas Titian only painted Perseus and Andromeda on one occasion, Thompson returns to it at least three times. I say at least because he was prolific. And so he makes two gouaches and one rather large painting on canvas, all in 1964, which is interesting because at that point he's in New York City and it's several years after he would have been in London in 1961 and would conceivably have seen um, the Poisier in person. Um, so one of these, if we go to the next uh, slide, please. One of these you may recognize uh, from the cover of the Whitney Museum retrospective. Um, as we were discussing earlier, it's interesting that when this image was discussed by one critic in connection with that show, um, it was misperceived as a depiction of Icarus. And so I think we'll go to the next slide and see the, the paired Titian and Thompson again. Um, 
And I, I think this return to a subject multiple times is actually something, you know, with variance is fairly standard for Thompson. Um, it also feels, Carol, like repetition is a theme and a device in Ovid as well, I think. Um, but what I want to just start us off by, we could say a little bit about the Titian painting first and then talk Thompson. Um, if you'd like, Nat. Sure. Yeah. Um, no, this is a terrific. I mean, Bob Thompson clearly was very interested in this painting, having made three versions of it. Um, the Titian it lives in the Wallace Collection in London. Uh, it's currently on display here in the Gardener in our exhibition. And it was chronologically the third painting in the group of mythological paintings that, that Titian made for Philip. Um, so he made the Danai and then the Venus and Adonis and then the Perseus. And the interesting thing about that is that the Danai and Venus and Adonis were both compositions which Titian was closely familiar with that he had done other versions of. So art historians feel that it, you know, even though we don't know why he chose those, there is reason to believe that Philip would have expected those if he had said, you know, I want a series of mythological paintings. The Perseus and Andromeda, on the other hand, the third painting in the series chronologically, is the first time that Titian tries out a new Ovid story that he hasn't painted before in this group of paintings. And that's interesting because we know from the technical analysis of this painting that he struggled with the composition. Andromeda was on the other side of the painting originally. Perseus was flipped around in the air with his legs um, very different than they are now. And so Titian really poured all of his creativity into working it out and figuring out the composition in the way that, that he felt he needed it to be. Um, but that it, it didn't start out the way that we see it here. And that's something that's also contributed a little bit to the condition that it's in today, which is um, has a few condition problems. Um, that's sort of the Titian side of it. There are so many wonderful differences though with the Bob Thompson that jump out. And I wonder if we could talk a little bit about those. I know I'm always with um, with these comparisons. It's always, I think, you know, what what is what does he preserve? I guess that's where I always start is what does he preserve? Because it is about a sort of reduction. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, fascinatingly, the the line really of the bodies, um, you know, we were talking about the way that Andromeda is represented here in more of a dance almost. Um, than a, a posture of um, captivity. Um, Carol, I know you had. Yes, I, I was struck by that. You know, uh, I, you're used to looking at those chains on the Titian, so you almost don't perceive for a second that the chains are absent. And uh, with the substitution of the chicken for the curved <laughs> sword of Perseus as well, you can see why somebody would have been confused and thought maybe the fall of Icarus because he does appear to be plunging into the sea. And uh, I'm not sure that a rubber chicken or a real chicken is going to be much use against the monster awaiting him. Um, and I enjoyed our conversation earlier about the humor uh, apparent here. And, uh, you know, it, it, it may seem like a strange moment to have humor, but there are, are uh, there are humorous moments in, in Ovid's text uh, so often. And, um, Thompson, though, was prepared to bring humor to uh, paintings uh, where there was none before. He was prepared to make um, paintings darker or more witty. Um, and uh, maybe you'd like to say that because it really does look almost like she's over here in the, in the corner um, doing an arabesque or some kind of uh, maybe like a Spanish dance of some, side, uh, some type. Mm -hmm. The, the humor also really comes out, um, I mean, it's something that Titian, I think, picks up on in Ovid, and he, he obviously struggled compositionally with the hero of Perseus and trying to get him in the right place, but he also seems to deliberately invest him with a certain amount of awkwardness. Um, you know, he's, he's a little bit gangly. He's not the macho beefcake that Titian can paint if he wanted to, that he had painted for Philip's aunt, for example. He's 
looks like he might just fall out of the sky and end up in the ocean or perhaps miss Andromeda. And I think in the contours of the body in Bob Thompson's painting, the wonderful kind of sinuous lines, he really emphasizes that, the silliness of this hero, which he then kind of puts a real punctuation mark on with the chicken. <laughs> I think that really sort of um, drives it home very directly. And he, he also picks up on Titian's kind of looking as if he, Perseus is falling into the monster's mouth, um, which right. would be really unfortunate for Andromeda. Yeah. Well, and I think what Thompson is so good at is he always sort of, um, you know, pulls the veil from the pretext of historical painting. And so, you know, there's, there's, when I see these two, there's comedy even in the flimsy attempt to conceal her nudity. Mm -hmm. And then his excessively clothed, over armored body, you know, it almost feels like he's careening into the sea because he's so heavy from his. <laughs> um, and so I think here, of course, now we see both figures nude, we see Perseus unarmed. Um, and that's, you know, that's really a kind of a point of continuity for Thompson. Um, that sort of weapon of, a, you know, that detail of a weapon or of armaments, that's something that he really refuses um, pictorially and, and reimagines. And so while justice and judgment, um, you know, and sort of conflict are, are themes within the work, um, you don't see those. And so this bird, that I think is is fascinating, <laughs> really brings the levity in, and it's also in the work, it's a symbol of the transformations he has made. So it it you see it calling attention to itself in those moments where he's taken a block of shadow or a sickle as here, um, a, a piece of drapery and he's rendered it uh, as a bird. And so um, it's something he adapts from Goya, who uses, who actually uses more of kind of a harpy, like a mythological half, half person, half bird figure. Um, but he, he, he puts a very intentionally um, lighthearted <laughs> spin on it. Um, he, it's interesting that he also chooses to render the body of Perseus in bright red, and that's shared by um, Andromeda in her hair, in her, her hair on her head and her pubic hair. And it kind of draws a, it draws a pictorial relationship between the two, which of course there will be because the consequence of the story is that per Perseus only agrees to rescue Andromeda if um, she can, he can have her hand in marriage and her parents agree. And so there is a future in which they will be sort of united in marriage. And I think Thompson suggests that a little bit with the shared palette. Although at the same time, he kind of obscures the future, uh, the, the city in the background of Titian's painting. He gets rid of the city completely and it's sort of obscured by this um, comedy bird. Um, and so I, yeah, there, there's, for me, there's a little bit of tension there between that kind of suggesting the next part of the story, but also trying to keep the dramatic focus on the two figures there. I wonder too if, you know, talking about the strength of colors, the highlighting of the mouth of the beast and the excessively large teeth, it, it, it's a little bit tempting to think of Ovid's um, attention to the Vagina Dentata image and yeah. that powerful women are so uh, dangerous and that maybe this Perseus figure will be emasculated eventually by, by, um, by, uh, by the woman Andromeda. Um, and, you know, we, we were noticing early, like wh when does uh, Bob Thompson uh, have the phallus visible and when does he not have it visible and uh, is the playing with color here um, is that actually more of a threat because he doesn't seem to have uh, a, a, a be endowed uh, with the what he would need all he has is a chicken <laughs> <laughs> and that is probably a good um, segue to thinking about um, the question of Andromeda's race as described in Ovid and as acknowledged in other depictions of the myth. Um, so I think, Nat, if you wanted to say. Yeah, I would just wanted to say a few words. I mean, so one of the things that's very striking about the Titians is that um, there are very few um, people of color in Titians paintings of the Poesie. Um, there's one black woman in the entire series of six paintings. 
But in fact, Andromeda was a princess of Ethiopia and Ovid is actually specific about how he describes her skin color as uh, fuscus, I believe, which um, Carol can help me on the translation there. Does it mean dark? Yeah, what he says is that she has the patriae fusca uh, colore suae, so the dusky skin, dusky skin of her fatherland. Um, and uh, that comes up in the row days where Sappho is telling or her uh, found that if he, if he finds her too dark, he should remember that um, uh, Perseus loved Andromeda despite her color. Um, and uh, elsewhere, he refers to her in the arts of love as being from the dark Indians. And um, the, the ancients weren't terribly clear where the Ethiopians actually were. <laughs> and sometimes they seem to think of them as Africans and sometimes they think of them as being um, further for, to, to the East. But um, it's important to remember that the Greek, the name Ethiopian comes from the Greek Ethiopes, which means burnt face. So whatever, uh, wherever they were from, they were going to be of darker skin. And that's so interesting. I mean, Titian is very typical of his moment in that he depicts Andromeda as white. And that also very much fits within this series of paintings in which other um, mythological figures of uh, different ethnicities from different parts of the Mediterranean are also simply made white without any suggestion of their skin color. Uh, one of the exceptions at this around um, this time is the Piero di Cosimo painting that we see here of Perseus and Andromeda. So same subject as Titian, but depicted in a different way. And you see, actually it's an episodic narrative. So you see Perseus appears three times. He's flying in at the top, he's killing the dragon, and then he's um, he wins Andromeda at the bottom right. And if you look, and Andromeda is at the far left, so she's swooning against the rock-like um, protrusion that the monster is headed towards. And then on the far right, where she's gathered together with Perseus, she's she has a darker skin color than Perseus. Piero di Cosimo seems very deliberate about um, not making her uh, black of the darker skin tone that the other um, individuals in the foreground are. So he depicts um, the king here, he depicts a musician here um, with much darker black skin, but he depicts Andromeda with this kind of, um, it's almost like a shadowy complexion. It's it's something in between Perseus's white skin and the, the much uh, darker skin of some of the other men in the foreground of the picture. So he seems very attuned to that. But I, I use this as an example just because it's it's such an outlier for this moment. Um, um, Piero di Cosimo seems really focused on something which other painters are not, and which, you know, in Titian's painting, um, Bob Thompson actually adopts also the, the figure of the white Andromeda. Mm -hmm. I think if we could go to the next slide, we have another comparison. Yeah, I mean, I, I uh, when I'm uh, teaching uh, Ovid, uh, I ask my students, I show them, you know, slide after slide of Perseus and Andromeda, and they've just read the text, and I say to them, so what jumps out at you? And uh, it usually takes a while, and somebody goes, like, wait, isn't she a queen of the Ethiopians or a princess of Ethiopia? Um, and it's actually kind of striking as well as how blindingly white she becomes. Um, I think you might, uh, we, we could have pulled up a, a ton of photographs uh, or paintings like that, um, 19th century German representations of her. It almost hurts to look at her. Uh, but there, there are a couple, uh, that, like we've just seen one, and now the, the, the uh, engraving we have of the Van Diepenbeek um, uh, illustration of it uh, is, also quite striking in, in the darkness of her skin. She's clearly an awful lot darker than um, the figure of Perseus behind her. Um, and in the two uh, other uh, Thompson paintings we have, we can also see that she's been, uh, well, she's, she's clearly like a white woman with almost red hair in the, in the first version that we looked at. Um, but uh, these other two versions uh, show her with uh, orangey brown tan skin. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know, Diana, do you want to say anything about the way uh, Thompson um, appropriates figures and paintings to make them uh, of color or deals with color? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's fascinating because there are moments when he very intentionally uses color to carry racial association forward, um, but within a project 
that on the whole also seems intent on challenging the systems in which certain colors signal racial otherness. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, um, I think in the next uh, comparisons that we'll look at, maybe that's a good um, uh, jump. We'll look at um, another uh, Thompson work on the left, Europa, and the dependent to the uh, petition that we were just looking at, the rape of Europa. But, you know, I think here, for example, and this is from 1958, so it's early um, for Thompson, but of um, the ways that he does use black and often for these sort of figures of, um, you know, kind of monstrosity and 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 simultaneously you can just sort of barely make it out um, in the back against the yellow tree um, the other consistently dark figure in his paintings is this hatted silhouetted person who is um, wow. kind of a an onlooker um, someone who's uh, you know often there voyeuristically sometimes pointing to the sort of center of the dramatic action, but in a gesture that's meant to deflect attention but draws attention to itself. So again, these are like the bird, a kind of um, you know thing you can't look away from. But this Europa is a very different <laughs> Europa from our Titian here, of course. And I think I'm immediately struck by um, how much he is executing this in a German expressionist palette and manner. And you know, the contrast between the profusion of detail in the Titian, the like, you know, excessive <laughs> information that Titian is giving us on the right is um, is quite extreme for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I think here it's less about um, compliments than about contrasts. Absolutely, um, you know, Titian is transforming this act of kind of foundational sexual violence into a sort of heroic narrative painting. And that's very much kind of in the tra tradition of that moment, even if he's doing it in some very different ways, like making the story of Europa maritime scene, which is unusual in painting at this time. He seems to be the first one who does this. Bob Thompson's Europa is landborn and it's it it feels more sinister. I think the, the expression on her face a little bit, the the way that the bull, well, the bull doesn't quite look like a bull. It almost looks like a, a dog or something is staring out at us with these red teeth. Um, and then the grass cuts this jagged profile along the bottom. It, it It's a very unsettling image in a very different way than the Titian. Well, and I'm so struck, I think, too, by the um on the in the Thompson work the the condensed closed form of the of her body you know again against the kind of and and her limbs sort of pressed tightly together as opposed to the sort of radial um body of Europa in the Titian um I don't know that we totally agree on our reading of this painting because I think so many of Thompson's uh, works really exploit ambiguity. They really teeter. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I want to cling to the possibility that um, she is, she may be resisting or may be capable of resistance here, um, in which case the bull's expression is maybe one of rage rather than lust. And, you know, I think um, it's rare to see him articulate uh, a figure's facial features um, as much as he does here, but it really, it, it communicates a kind of um, distress uh, exertion, maybe. I don't know, there's something um, I, wanna, I wanna hold out for that possibility, maybe. Uh, maybe I could just jump in and say that, you know, uh, the uh, Titian painting actually beautifully captures uh, in very small details, the positioning of, the, uh, of Europa on the back of the bull. Um, with your one foot almost touching the other pulled up. But her position is also fairly erotic, I suppose, for the viewers uh, in, in the court. Um, and as you said, you know, her, her body is splaying out with the movement, um, whereas uh, Thompson has made her 
close over protectively. And there's no question of seeing um, the beast behind her as anything other than threatening. Whereas very often representations of the rape of Europa um, either make the bull seem fairly innocuous, like a, like a prize, uh, gentle family uh, pet, um, or like the Simon Fouet painting where he's licking his lips lasciviously, looking back at her, uh, at her um, uninformed innocence. Um, whereas here you get the sense that Thompson uh, allows Europa to know what's coming and the, the, the awfulness, the violence of what uh, Jupiter is doing here is, is revealed. And that's, um, I think I'm, I'm conscious of our final minutes and we wanna at least get one question in, um, but if we go to the next slide, um, these, this was really uh, just in here to, um, to, I think offer again, sort of further context within Thompson's of, um, of the work of this moment. And, you know, these, um, these, these monsters um, on the left in a painting called Black Monster from 1959, the year that he met Carol Plenda, the white woman he would later marry. Um, and, you know, again and again, I think the monster, um, is, he uses the monster to sort of materialize um, the cultural association of blackness with sexual menace. And so um, as one of the essayists in the catalog um, wrote, Young radical African Americans, including Thompson, were articulating a new black sense of self that linked interracial sex with racial equity and black freedom. And on the right, um, just another comparison of a work that I think makes pronounced um, some of the ways that he intervenes, in this case, into a, uh, a frangelico um, scene of martyrdom, um, add, converting one of the, um, the deaths from a decapitation into um, a lynching at center. So maybe we'll just go to this last slide, which I think we won't even really deal with, but we'll leave everyone <laughs> curious about. Um, this is a Thompson that's not in the exhibition or in the catalog, but is um, potentially the last painting he was working on at the time of his death. So he interestingly returns the Poesier in 1966 when he's in Rome and um, it's hard to judge since I think it is potentially so unfinished, but you know, we see already how faithful um, it is in some respects to the Titian here. Um, and I think we may just take a question if we have a moment to do so. So I think we'll be joined by Sierra, our Anne Lunder Leland Curatorial Fellow who will help us with those. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for that great conversation. Um, we have several questions um, in the Q&A, um, but I think um, just being conscious of time, maybe uh, a good one would be, what prompted Thompson to bring the classics to life? In his first summer in Provincetown, Walter Chrysler opened his museum, which contained a large number of European artists. Did Thompson visit? along with the MFA and Gardner in his Boston days. And then more of a comment um, on that is in Provincetown at the same time where Katz, Rothko, Motherwell, Grooms, all masters, all quite different in their style. Yes, um, that's a great question. I think the answer is that his interest um, sort of predated that. And um, actually, you know, it was, uh, while artistic, even as a child, um, and exposed to, I think, a tremendous curriculum focused around European painting uh, at the University of Louisville through a number of the faculty there. He also is has always been, and um, this remains the case, um, interested in looking at artwork and reproduction. And even in many instances where he's painting um, on paper, painting over, painting a version of <laughs> something directly over it. Um, so I think he, that is when he was in Provincetown, he was certainly an avid museum goer and sketcher um, on, on the premises. And, you know, my understanding is that once he made it to Provincetown, he sort of everything opened up for him. And, you know, hence, I think the drive to continue to return to Europe, even as he's trying to establish himself in New York. Um, 
So I, um, I worry that we've come to an end um, because I know there are back-to-back -back events this evening <laughs> here at Colby. Um, but I want to just thank you all so much, my fellow panelists, of course, a pleasure as always. We'll have to do this um, in person at some point. Um, but all of you out there, thank you for joining and please consider a visit to the exhibition. We're free and open to all. And this exhibition, Bob Thompson, This House is Mine, will be on view through January 9th. If you're not able to visit in person, there's a wealth of information on our website. Titian Women, Myth and Power is incredible and on view at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum through January 2nd as well. So please note that the program has been recorded and will be available with captioning in about a week. We encourage everyone to register for an yet another Thompson related virtual program. The evening lecture series at the New York Studio School is uh, hosting Bob Thompson's Life and Legacy scheduled for 6.30 p.m. on November 3rd. I'll be speaking with Adrian Childs and Nadine Pierre and information about how to register for this program is available on our calendar or on the New York Studio School website. So I wanna also thank Colby ITS and wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Diana. Thanks, Thanks Diana. Joe. Thanks.